So you mentioned the debut a little bit earlier and the description of that that you give is is pretty interesting. You, you talk about sparring um, Daniel Thorpe and, and how difficult that was. And then you make that make that debut. Dean Powell gets the, gets the opponent for you. And his name was Dean Mark Antonio. And you assumed that he was a Mexican and you weren't keen. And then Dean Powell explained what kind of opponent he was. But I mean, that was... Again, that was debuts are going to be nerve wracking for anybody, but particularly in your case, because there was a big spotlight. There was a big spotlight. And there's a big spotlight, like Matt said, if you've won an Olympic gold medal and you're turning over, because that's going to be on the TV too. But as he said, you hadn't done that. Everybody's looking at you and you don't really know how you're going to perform. Yeah, definitely. Whenever I've played in front of massive crowds at football, I was never nervous at all. For the simple reason is I, I knew I could I was good, so it's like Olympic gold medalist. It's obviously the professional debut, but they know they're good. Otherwise, they wouldn't have won an Olympic gold medalist. But with boxing, I'd never really I've never sparred with eight ounce gloves on. I've never had a fight. I've never sparred without a head guard on. I had no idea what was going to happen once I got hit. You know, just um, it was a horrible feeling really. And I'll never one of the worst feelings I've ever had in my life was when I got a knock on the door from the whip. Um, put his head around the door and said, oh, Curtis, uh, two minutes you're doing your ring walk. And it just hit me. Oh, God, this is actually happening, is it? I was hoping Dean Mark Antonio wasn't going to turn up in his ear. And then I, I walked out and it was at, it was at um, I think, it, I can't remember where it was. It was, it was at the Grosvenor House in, in London. And it was a, a ch- one of them Deborah charity events. And it was absolutely packed. I remember what Jonathan Ross was there. And I remember walking to the ring thinking, what the hell am I doing? My legs were like jelly. I remember thinking the first time I get it here, I am gone because I just, it was a horrible, horrible experience, but the best experience of my life. Because once you had that first one, you never get that first, ex- you never get that same feeling again. Um, yeah, and it, it was horrible. I'm, like when Dean Powell rang me up, uh, Dean said, I've got your opponent, uh, Dean Mark Antonio. I don't know if I can, can I swear on here? Yeah, I swear away. Yeah, okay. So he said, I've got your opponent, Dean Mark Antonio. And I said, fucking no chance. And I'm not fighting a Mexican on my debut, Dean. No way. And he said, uh, he said he's not a Mexican. He's a fucking window cleaner from London. He said, he's the worst kid we can find. He said, if you can't beat him, he said, we, we, I don't know what we can do. He said, I, I had one of my kids boxing last week. And he made him look like fucking Sugar Ray Leonard. So I, I was like, all oh, right, okay. So I, I turned up, and I think at, at the time, the, the rankings came out the week before my fight, and I was ranked 189th in Great Britain at welterweight out of 189, and he was ranked 187th. So it was, it was literally the donkey derby. And I remember, like, the, the first round went, and it was nip and tuck, and, and I dropped him, I think I dropped him twice in the third round, and I won by one point. So I literally scraped by against the worst kid that they could find. And it was a real humbling experience. I remember being in the dressing room after, absolutely shattered. It was four two minutes that we did, which is like the lowest you can do as a professional. But I couldn't handle any more. I was blowing out my ass. And he came in the dressing room after, and I was laid on the floor in like a starfish position, gasping for air. <laughs> and he came in and he says, oh, fuck me, you all right, Sam? <laughs> and he said, uh, if you ever need any sparring, give me a shout. And I remember just putting my hand on. I couldn't even talk. I was that tired. And he just walked out. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, it's going to be a long, long journey this is. <laughs> so, Matt, you're chuckling away there. Yeah. No, I couldn't stop laughing because it never, and it, I know it never will. I'll never, it'll never... I'll never not laugh when I hear someone describing that feeling about when the whip comes in and says, you've got two minutes. Because I'm laughing with the identification. You know, no matter how many fights you have, no matter how experienced you get, you'll still get that feeling. You know, fighters still get that feeling. You know, I know stakes get higher and, you know, you go through big titles and things, but it doesn't matter. You, you know, no matter how experienced you are, you still get that feeling. It's like the, the countdown and every little stage where they go, Right, let's get wrapped, get the hands wrapped. You get a little blast of them, and then you, you know that wears off a little bit. And then when they say, right, let's get gloved up, oh, you get another rejection after. <laughs> but when that whip comes in and says like five minutes, two minutes, or, or when you finish the pad work and you start putting the gown on, it starts cranking up a few gears, doesn't it? You know what I mean? That that anticipation. But I think it's that, I think it's that feeling which is so horrendous in the changing rooms, which makes, you know, when you, you win a fight and everyone's like, ah, 
you know, there's no feeling like winning a fight. I mean, I'm sure Curtis can testify for this. Listen, Curtis, I never played professional football, but I played a lot of sport when I was younger. Usually when you're good at one sport, you're usually pretty good at quite a lot of sports. So yeah. when I was good at a lot of sports and I played all these different things and was quite successful, but it was, you know, I could score a hat-trick in a cup final from a you know, Sunday team, which at the time was a big thing. So you got team spirit, but it was nothing in comparison to winning a yeah. boxing that high is just pure elation, isn't there's it? There's nothing. There's nothing close. And I, and I think what you're saying there, it, it, it's so true. And I think a lot of the 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 brilliant feeling is just pure relief. Relief. You spend, you spend so long <laughs> shitting yourself, don't you? <laughs> you know what I mean? For like the eight weeks, you see fighters doing the, the press conference and like, oh, he's confident. But if you actually box, you know deep down <laughs> that he's blagging it in. He's Everyone's blagging. Stuff. We Everyone all do. We, we're all, we're all absolutely. <laughs> and one thing that, you know, what I found crazy when I first went into boxing, so I was only a fan, I used to watch it on the TV. And then when I started to go to shows, and I used to think to myself, God, he's actually shitting himself here. And I was like, I can't believe it. And then obviously once I got in, I was like, ah, I get it now. Yeah, because I'm absolutely petrified. Everyone I boxed, I was scared, scared in the dressing room, like scared of being embarrassed, scared of losing. It wasn't so much the losing I was scared about. I was just worried about making a show of myself, you know, getting embarrassed and having everyone laughing at me. Um, that's what I was more scared about. But it's, it's a horrible feeling. But it is a feeling that keeps drawing you back in because as soon as it's done and you've won, that's the feeling you miss. That's the feeling I miss now of not competing. The, the feeling I miss is a feeling of that nervousness because I don't get that in anything, anything I do now. That horrible sickening feeling where you're praying to God that your opponent hasn't actually turned up and this is all just one big joke and, and we're all going to, uh, it's not really going to happen. But like you said, like Matt said, as soon as you get that open the door and the whip puts his head around the corner, you're like, you're on in two minutes. God, honestly, the blood just <laughs> drains through your body. It's horrible. It's horrible, but brilliant. So we'll just fast forward a bit. You, you notched up a good number of, of wins and then your first defeat came against Jay Morris when you were yeah. 10 and 0. That was over in over in Belfast. So how did you manage to keep the faith after that? I mean, how, how bad was that, that first defeat? How much did that affect you? Well, I think if you look at my record, I, I got to 9 and 0. Um, and I think with the first nine kids that I beat, they probably had a combined record of maybe 10 wins between them. Jay Morris was the first guy, really, that started punching me back. And I was like, oh, my God, what's all this about? Have you not read the script here, mate? I used to play football. You're not allowed to punch me. And Jay was rugged and a tough guy, you know, technically not great, but rough and tough. And it was that welterweight. And that was actually the fight I realised I'm not a welterweight. You know, when I was at light welter, you know, I, I was always quite physically strong at light welter. And my punches would make a, an effect on the other person. At welter, I just didn't have that same impact. And Jay Morris was, you know to put it bluntly, was just too tough for me, really. Too rugged, too tough, you know, too experienced. And he just, he bowled me to the to the ropes, bashed, beat me up a little bit. I didn't get hurt or anything like that, but he was just too rough and too too rugged. Um, so after that fight, I retired, you know. And I'll tell you what broke my heart in that fight. That was on Satanta. Remember the old Satanta days? It was on Satanta and I'd just signed a deal with uh, David Hay. Um, and David Hay was ringside with Adam Booth. Um, and obviously them to me are like really famous people. I've been watching David Hay since I was a kid and watching world title fights. And they were sat ringside. And I remember sat in the dressing room thinking, they think I'm shit. You know, and, and it was a real, like, like I just explained earlier, I was never scared of losing. That didn't bother me. I was never scared of getting knocked out, getting hurt. I was scared about being embarrassed. And that was a real low moment for me. Because, you know, David Hay and... And Adam Booth was sat there. And I remember him thinking, they just must think I'm rubbish, wasting everybody's time here. Um, and so I retired. You know, I rang Dave up the next day and said, I'm done. I said, you know, I can't. I, I'm not embarrassing myself like this anymore. I'm no good. Like I said, at this point, I still not want to round in sparring. You know, I've been, get, I've been getting beat up every day in sparring. It just got to a point where I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm done here. What's the point? I, can, I think I'm only 27 at this point. I can easily go back to football. I'll have four or five more years doing that. And, I tried it, gave it my best, I just wasn't very good. So my initial reaction was to was to jack it in um, until I pulled my head out of my ass a couple of days later. And I just thought, you know what, I can't be known as the guy that, 
you know, ran away from football and now I've had one defeat and I'm running away from, from boxing. And again, you know what? Dean Powell was, was brilliant for me. Um, bearing in mind, you know, you look at all the fighters that Frank Warren had had, you know, massive names. I'm nobody. You know, I don't, I've never even spoke to Frank. I always used to do my dealings with Dean Powell. And Dean rang me and, and I, I left um, Frank Warren at this point. So, but I kept in, always kept in touch with Dean. And Dean rang me up and said, how are you feeling? I said, I'm just gutted, Dean. You know, I'm, you know, I'm embarrassing myself doing this. And he said to me, he said, you know Muhammad Ali lost five times, don't you? And I was like, yeah. And he says, so if he can lose five, I'm sure you can deal with losing what? You know, they, they call him the greatest that's ever done it. And he lost five times. You've lost one and you're ready to quit. And that was a real, like, shot in the arm for me. At a time, really, where if no one had have said anything to me, I'd have, just, I'd have called it a day. Um... But yeah, that was a real pick me up moment for me. And I thought, you know what, he's right. You know, I can I can deal with this. I'll bounce back and and, and I did. And and after that fight as well, a big thing was me, I've lost now. I'd lost. So I wasn't really asked, I wasn't protecting anything. Let's just go and see how far I can go. I don't need to, you know, at that point when I first started, there's still a massive emphasis on people's O's at the time. There's not so much now, it's going away a little bit. But at that time, everyone had to be undefeated, otherwise they were rubbish. But once I'd lost, and I was rubbish anyway, I had nothing to lose. So I kind of felt like that was a real turning point for me. And, I, you know, we, we took the stabilizers off. I think after that, I, I started to fight better kids and get better and better. Um, I think my next fight, or the one after that, I, I rematched Jay Morris and I knocked him out in two rounds. So that was a real good moment for me, um, seeing how I'd, I'd improved. And, yeah, it was, it was a good moment, that, that first loss. And I'm still in touch with Jay now, and he, he, he's a good kid, but... He beat me simply because he was tougher than me. That's just how it was. Well, you did you did ramp things up from from that point onwards, and, and we'll get into that um, in in a in a couple of minutes. But I just wonder, during the tough times, to what extent did that promise that you'd made kind of sustain you and keep you going? Just just take us through that. Just to explain to people what that was that the, the promise you made to your old man that that, that you were going to do this. Well, I think my dad died after my third fight. Um, and my dad was always, you know, as, as a sportsman myself, um, I went all around the country chasing my dream to be a footballer. Some of my best memories of a kid of being in my dad's red Ford Cortina. He used to have Otis Redding on the, re on the, we used to have one of them little tape cassette things, Otis Redding in. We traveled all over the country together, me chasing my dream. And, you know, my dad was so proud. And me and my dad were really really close and we had a really really strong bond and I'll never forget one day my sister rang me and said where are you and I was in Rotherham I just finished training I said oh I'm in Rotherham why I said you need to get to Hull Royal Infirmary as soon as you can dad's had a really bad stroke um, so I rushed to Hull Royal Infirmary and like most lads um, we all think our dads are indestructible you know my dad was like a proper like a uh, man's man you know, he, he was Superman to me. I never thought, I'd never know my dad was ill. He, he, he was just always like, how, whenever I touched his body, it was rock solid. He'd grafted his whole life in manual labor. So his body was just like work hard. You know, you know, you, you touch an athlete's body and the muscle in, and then you touch a man's body that's been working his whole life. It's a different type of hardness. You know, my dad had that like manual labor toughness. He was just a man's man. And uh, so... And I just thought my dad was going to live forever, like most kids do. And I rushed to the hospital and the nurse pulled me to the side. So I was my dad's next of kin because his twin brother, my dad's twin brother had died five years earlier from a stroke. Um, just quickly going back, my dad was, um, my dad's actual name on his birth certificate is Bernardo's Tufik Woodhouse. And he went by the name of Bernard. But his name's Bernardo's because he was left on Bernardo's doorsteps um, a few weeks old and was then fostered by my nana and raised in the north of England with his twin brother. Um, and my, my dad's twin brother, my uncle Carson, died five years before of a stroke. So when I went to the hospital, the nurse said to me, um, your dad's had a stroke um, and there's nothing, there's nothing we can really do at the moment. And I thought in my head that that just meant he's had a stroke, but he, he's going to be okay. Because after my uncle Carson, he had his first stroke and then had a second massive one that killed him. But he recovered from his first one. I thought she was telling me that the same had, had happened with my dad. Um, so I was like, all oh, right, okay, what does that mean? We, you, does he have to go on medication? And, and she said, oh, oh no, um, he's had a stroke, a bleed on his brain, 
is too big for us to operate, he, he, he'll die within the next hour. And I just couldn't believe it. Um, and he, and he, my dad's eyes were still open. I remember just thanking him for everything. And I promised him literally about five minutes before he died that I'd, that I'd win the British title. You know, I was crying my eyes out. And, and I promised him that. And I, to answer your question, you know, it was, it was something that haunted me for years, you know, because like I said, my dad always did everything that he said he was going to do for me. And the last thing I said to my dad was going to end up a lie. I was so far off winning the British title. And it haunted me for ages. And, you know, sometimes I think, God, I wish I'd never made that promise. You know, I had so many sleepless nights. And every time I lost, I just felt like a, a, such a, a failure because I'd not been able to keep that promise. So, yeah, it, 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 was, it was tough. 